Can everybody hear me? Yes. Cool. Um, my name is Dave Greenberg. For those of you who don't know me, um, I am a, the senior member of the court team. And I say senior because I'm really old, <laughs> um, certainly compared to the other people on the team. Um, and I've been working uh, with Civi and on Civi for uh, really 10 years, um, which is why I have all these gray hairs in my beard. Um, but I'm really excited to be here uh, in Denver and see lots of new faces and, and also uh, some old friends. And I'm really excited to be sharing uh, our newest release with folks here because I think there's a lot of cool stuff in it and stuff that's going to be really helpful for organizations and hopefully for implementers. Um, how many folks here have actually either taken a look at or installed the 4.6 release? Mm -hmm. A few, cool. Um, just out of curiosity, I'm trying to see where people are at in terms of the release cycles. Um, for those who know what release you're on or working with, how many are on or working with 4.4, which is our long-term support release? 4.5? And how many people have actually installed 4.6 and are using it in production? Come on. Okay. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, so uh, for those who have not been following along, 4.6 was released uh, just a couple of uh, weeks ago after a pretty long alpha and beta cycle. Um, we're about uh, six, seven months out from our last release, which is 4.5. Um, the project has been doing between one and two releases a year. And uh, that's um, always been an interesting topic of discussion. Uh, some people think we do too many releases, and some people think we do not enough releases. Um, but to a large extent, our release cycle is driven by the community and by the features that um, people have come to us and said they need, um, to a large extent, features that have been actually sponsored in a financial way. Um, by organizations, some of whom are in this room, um, features that have been built by some of our partners and developers in our ecosystem for their clients and their organizations. And in those cases uh, where the, the organization has um, been a really good citizen of our open source community and said, not only do I need this feature and I'm going to help uh, fund for it to happen for our organization, but I'm going to go the extra mile and make sure that that feature is contributed back to the core code base, which means that the whole community can get, a, get, a, uh, get, get to use it. Um, and I want to make very clear that that's not always what happens. Um, there is a lot of development that goes on in CiviCRM um, where people are building stuff and um, they're not necessarily sharing it. And um, I'd like to shame and guilt everybody into doing less of that because I think one of the things that really makes the community strong is sharing. Um, but it's not easy and there's an expense to it and a time to it. So I understand why sometimes it doesn't happen. But um, those of you who are here from uh, end user organizations, if you are working with a developer or a partner and they're actually building something cool and new for you, um, I would really encourage you to um, be a stickler about saying that that cool new thing should not just be delivered to you, but should be proposed um, for in addition to the entire core, um, or at least a publicly shared extension, so that everybody else can take advantage of it. And aside from it being sort of a nice thing to do and a good thing to do, it also is, means it's more likely that that piece of code, that functionality, has a stronger future. Because it means that it's not just you or your developer that are responsible for taking care of it, but now we have a much broader group of people who are doing that. So that's my little rant. <laughs> um, but mostly what I want to do today is uh, share some of the cool new things that are in this new release. Um, our releases um, always have quite a lot of stuff in it. And um, even for me, I sometimes like and I'm kind of on top of the queue and seeing what's going on. Someone's, oh, oh, really? That's in there? How cool. Um, so I'm hoping to not only share some of the bigger things, but maybe some of the smaller things that you might not have noticed or you might not notice once you get 4.6 going, but you could really um, take advantage of. And um, I'm going to share this presentation with Corinne Jalmi, who's with us from Mumbai. And he's uh, also a member of the core team and a uh, really great
great developer and somebody who's been with the project for a long time uh, helping us move forward. So we're going to do this together. Um, so 4.6 um, has some bigger stuff in it and we're going to go over that first and then I'm going to talk about some of the uh, smaller, maybe more hidden features that are in there. Um, but the big stuff, um, the first one is the idea of repeating events and activities um, so that if you have an event like a course that recurs um, more than once, uh, you don't have to necessarily create that event over and over and over again. With the activities, if you have a, um, a meeting or some other type of activity, a phone call that happens regularly, again, you don't have to create those individually, but you can set a schedule for them. And this is something that's been our, on our roadmap for quite a long time, um, but finally sort of all the pieces came together in terms of um, several organizations that wanted to do it and a design and some developers who are participating in making it happen. Um, second biggest feature in here is adding the concept of sales tax or value added tax to things in CiviCRM. Um, a lot of people use CiviCRM to, um, I don't know if I want to use the word sell, but it kind of is selling things, whether it's uh, memberships or t-shirts or um, uh, tickets for events. And in some places, uh, those items need to be taxed. And CiviCRM didn't have a really good way to record and account for those taxes in the past. So <clears throat> that functionality has been added in 4.6 uh, optionally. It's something that you can use if it's useful for you. Um, along with that functionality is the idea of generating an invoice, which can show tax information as well as um, basically the line items that are, being, that are involved in a particular transaction. Um, and so those two pieces, are, they were added together. You may want to use one or the other or both. Um, the fourth thing that I want to show off that's kind of a big thing is we've taken the CiviMail uh, user interface and completely redesigned it. Um, those of you who may have been sitting in on uh, Tim and Coleman's presentation before the break um, probably saw some, some bit about it and some of the rationale, but basically um, we'd been getting a lot of feedback that um, it was uh, a little bit too painful and a little bit too clunky to be using CiviMail and we wanted to modernize that. Um, we got a really nice kickstart in that project uh, through a Google Summer of Code project. Um, and then the core team took that work uh, with some funding from some wonderful folks, including Progressive Tech Project in the New York State Senate um, to help push that forward and have something that could be part of 4.7. And we'll show you some of the cool stuff in that. Um, a second thing that happened, again, starting with Google Summer of Code was uh, A-B testing for CiviMail. How many people are familiar with the idea of A-B testing? Cool, okay. Um, so this has been a piece of functionality that um, a lot of folks who use um, other mail blast tools like uh, MailChimp and Constant Contact love and have been interested in and it's something that's kind of been a missing piece um, in CiviMail for a while. And uh, so we now are able to offer that feature as, as part of the CiviMail usage and we hope people are going to find it useful. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, share a bit about that. So those are the big things. Um, the other thing that a lot of energy has gone into in this release has been uh, continuing to make the user interface work a little bit more like an app. Um, so reducing the number of uh, page reloads that happen when you're going from one place to another, um, allowing for more in-place editing, um, making the kind of little widgets that appear in forms easier to use and more intuitive and sort of creating shortcuts for you. And I'll show off some of those as well. Um, and a lot of those are, are thanks to uh, our um, core team member, Coleman Watts, who's very sort of passionate about this kind of stuff and has been sort of rolling through the code and finding places where he can make it friendlier and easier for us uh, for the last couple of years, actually. So uh, let's dig into some of the details here. Um, so repeating activities, um, let's say that you have a weekly volunteer meeting or a weekly staff meeting and um, you hold it with the same group of people and you'd like to record it as an activity so that you know what's happening. Uh, those of you who use 
um, the activities on the dashboard wanted to appear on people's dashboards as a reminder that they have an activity coming up. Um, in the past, you would have to create each of those activities, one after another after another. Um, and now what we can do is we can go into the activity form and there is a um, panel. I don't really have a pointer here. Do I? Yeah, I have a mouse, cool. Um, so right here, you can see this repeat activity uh, pane. And that allows you to set um, how often it repeats. Um, so in this case, I have repeat once a week. Um, and uh, when it repeats, and we'll look at the screen actually on my, uh, on my computer in a minute. Um, but basically you do that once and you can say that it can repeat a certain number of times or you can say it repeats until a certain date. And you can also exclude dates and repeat. So if there's a holiday or some day that you're not gonna have that within the sequence, you can set that up right away and see it. Um, and then the other cool thing is that um, if you need to make a change partway through this sequence of activity. So let's say that the meeting changes location. Um, you can go into the next occurrence of that activity, make the change, and you'll get prompted. Do I want to apply that change just for this particular instance? Or do I want to have the change roll through the rest of the sequence? Um, so there's a lot of conveniences there as well. Let's take a quick look at how that looks in a form. Um, so this is an example of a weekly dev team meeting. And I've already actually created the recurring thing. Here was the original one, which uh, is scheduled for today, actually. Um, and then I had it repeat um, every day, uh, every week um, through July 1st with some exclusions. Um, and so let's say now it's uh, May 6th, and I need to change the room that it happens in. I can go in here and say, well, no, it's not in room 201 anymore. It's in room 222. And save that. And I get this prompt where it says, should this affect only this activity, this activity onwards, or every activity? Well, I don't care about the past. So I'm going to say, let's repeat. Let's change this for the activity onward. And it just goes ahead, updates all that activities for you pretty nicely. A similar model, oh, okay, sorry. Um, so when I say that I want to create the repeating activity, one cool thing that happens is that it comes back and it um, gives me a confirmation. So it, before I actually save and create all these activities, it's saying, okay, this is what I've got. I'm going to create these for you. Is that right? And you can either go back and adjust the repeating schedule or click go, and then it actually goes and creates all those records for you. For consistency, <laughs> the, same, the same model is being used for events. So um, if I have manage events and I want to make an event repeat after I've created it, I go to a repeat tab. Um, and I have the same kind of interface where I can um, say that this event is going to repeat more than one time. And so this is going to be really useful for courses or meetups or other kinds of things that happen on a regular schedule, on a monthly schedule, a weekly schedule. Um, and you can do it by um, day of the month or day of the week, depending upon what your occurring interval is. Um, so let's take a look at that in the interface. So here's um, our configure event screen. And I've got this set up for a meeting facilitation course. So this is the, the new um, repeat tab that we have. Um, which is right here. And when we go to that tab, we get uh, a new little subform here. And so I can say, when does this repeat start? In this case, this is a course that happens every month. And I want it to happen not by day of the month, but I want it to happen on the first Wednesday of the month. Um, and I want it to keep repeating until um, March 2016. But um, you can see here, I've set up some exclude dates, and I can set up Another one, let's say that I want to exclude uh, the 12th of August as well. I can pick that from a calendar. And so when it creates the sequence, it's going to skip that one. And when I go save that, 
you're going to see a similar thing to what I showed on the other screen where you've got um, a confirmation Ooh. of the Ooh. events. This is my confirmation, and if I look at these dates and they look like they're correct, um, then I can click continue, and it's going to go, and I'm getting an error. See, you shouldn't demo stuff that you haven't tried. <laughs> um, that's because I loaded this screen quite a while ago, and the session expired. So yeah. Let's try that again. OK. Back to the repeat screen. I want to repeat this every month on the first Wednesday. I want to end April 6th next year. I want to exclude May 6th. And go. Cool. OK. And so now I have all these other events that are now in my system that are available for people to sign up for, and, uh, and we're all ready. I created basically 10 events with one click. So if you're on the Drupal platform and you're using web forms, you could, once you have these multiple events, you could set up a web form that would invite people to, apply, to register for all six of them, let's say, if it was a series. Um, so that's, that's a potential solution for that type of use case. Others? OK, cool. Um, so Kern's going to talk to us a little bit about the sales tax and VAT functionality. OK, uh, so, uh, so there are basically three steps in which you can enable uh, sales tax and invoicing feature in 4.6. So this is the first step where you say, okay, I want to use the sales tax feature and say, enable sales tax, and then you get all these various options. So one of the option is you can uh, set the prefix for the invoice. You can have credit notes. You can set the prefix for it. You can also specify the due date when the in, if invoice is generated, when is the actual due date, and you can have a standard notes. You can also configure the terminology. For example, here in states is using a, used as sales tax, but in some other parts it might be used as VAT. So you can change and it's configurable. Plus you can also change how tax should be displayed. So once you enable this, the next uh, step is to create a financial account. Uh, and the main thing is you define your tax rate here. So this uh, enables the tax feature. And one important thing to note here is the financial account type should be a liability because you have, how many people, just uh, if you're not familiar with taxing, uh, just you have to set it as liability for now. Just so simply. And then you create a financial type and then link the newly financial account which you have created to the sales tax account. That's it. Once you are done with it, for example, in this event screen, you'll be able to see this fee and it includes uh, sales tax and it shows the percentage. And once you sign up, even emails and everything includes the sales tax. Second, uh, you can also include the similar thing for contribution pages. Once you sign up, you'll be able to see the actual breakdown, breakdown in the view page, total tax, how much was the tax. So it went by kind of fast, but there's some configurability as to how that tax is shown to the person who's making the transaction yeah. as to whether it's shown separately or added together um, and what the language is. Yeah. So if I don't know whether it's visible, but here there are option to print invoice or email invoice. So if so, you, so now CV generates this kind of invoicing, which tells gives a breakdown of what was the tax, what was the line items for that contribution. Yeah. Similar to invoice, uh, CV also generates credit notes. Mm -hmm. So if you are refunding or if you cancel a contribution or event it will uh, allow you to generate a credit note. All right, uh, let me just quickly show you some options. Yeah. 
So here are the text display options. So whether you want to display text, you can have the text but not display. You can say inclusive or you can also say exclusive. So it's very configurable in that sense. Okay, I'll move. So next thing, uh, I'll show you uh, how how we streamline the Hang CVM. Hang on a sec. Are there, are there questions oh. about the invoicing or uh, tax? Just about sales tax. Because depending on the line, I think can be a different amount. Yes, for, you are talking about price set. Can you? Yes, yeah, so you can have a financial type associated with each price set, each line item. And based on the line item, it will be defined. The text will be different for each of the line items. Yeah. yeah, so another yeah. way to say it is that the, the tax rate is set in the financial account, which is tied to a financial type. Yeah. So if you need different tax rates for different things that you're doing in your transactions, different financial type, different financial account, set that rate. And then since starting in 4.5, you are able to set different financial types for each item in a price set. The tax rate now follows along with that. And hopefully, this is probably a little gobbledygook for people who don't use the CV accounting stuff, yeah. but hopefully it makes sense. Yeah. Were all things configured on the invoicing? What activities or what events or uh, what activities can trigger the invoicing? Is there a way to tie that together? Or? So, uh, so, basic, so basically, you, uh, invoicing, like if you want to print an invoice, is that your question? Yeah. So if you want to print an invoice, once the contribution is done, you can go to the page and say, okay, I want to download this invoice. That's the one way of doing it. The second way is uh, on contact dashboard where a user can look, see his contribution. So he can go and say, okay, I want to download the invoice. And the third method would be you can search for contributions and uh, do a bulk sending of the email. Yeah, you yeah. have an option to attach the invoice to the email at the transaction point. Yeah, so this, so here there's an option where you can automatically send the emails. No, I don't think it will work that well with that. Um, For the remainder. Well, it sh I'm pretty sure that it shows balance owing. So I think that will work for you. So you, so it, so you'll have an uh, invoice which will say, uh, let's say it was $200. It will say you paid 100 and it will say the remain over remainder is like 100. So you won't able to generate separate invoice only for 100, but a, one invoice with both the options. Questions? Yeah. Can invoicing be set up for any contribution page? How do you set it up? Yeah, it could be set up for it. Like once once you create a so <laughs> once you create a account and once you create a financial type for any contribution page, you just need to go and set up the financial type for the tax, and that's it. You, then you'll get all the. Yes, it's a message number, so you can change the content and everything. All right. 
Moving along. Oh, as they mentioned, uh, CVML uh, UI uh, was one of the all CVML UI was a part of GSOC project last year, and we uh, took that work which was done by students, and uh, we restructured. And Tim Martin from team uh, from CV team worked and came up with uh, this nice looking UI. So, so a lot of people early on complain about a wizard system which we had like three steps, and people didn't want like. We want two steps. Some people said we want uh, we don't want any steps. Some people say we want two steps. So good news is we are, we have all three options for you. <laughs> so whichever you want, you choose. It's up to you. So by default, we show this interface, which is a slick. Uh, I'll demo it later. I'll just quickly go through all the interfaces. So here, all the options are there. In first option is you compose your mail. You see a. Uh, how it previews and everything. Second option, you just review and uh, set the schedule, send the email. And second option is, uh, this is the people who still like wizards. We have three options. First three option, steps. you- Three steps. Three steps. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so first option, you compose. Second, you have options. And last one, you review. And for those people who are lazy like me, everything is on one page. So you don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> so you just go through from compose your mail through check your preview and send. That's it. You are done. Let's look at a quick demo of this. All right. So. Right, so I'm going to use, let's see, click on newsletter. Oops. Oops, okay. And I'm going to use default template. One of the cool thing about this is, if you see on top here, it auto saves. So you don't have to worry about like, closing the page, it automatically saves on the background once you make any changes. So it's very, you don't lose any content, you can come back and continue on the same thing. And we have this new wizard, which is, you se select, let's say I select advisory board, newsletter, on the side we sh show approximately how many contacts, if you click on it, it shows you what all contact you're going to issue as a sample of contacts. You can use your tokens as always. So all the tokens are available in a nice friendly manner. You can have a tab into, you can attach files. You can have a header footer, other options. Then I say, let's me preview it. It shows the preview. Elliot? Yeah. yeah. Can you speak to why you removed the previous option of do not mail to previous recipients? There is the option. Yeah. Do not mail to previous emails, right? Yeah. yeah. Previous yeah. So in the current system, I don't have previous emails. So that's why it's not being shown. It will show up. It will show up once your previous option. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. That would be a bad thing. <laughs> Yeah, once you preview, you can send the test mail via same interface, let's say. If you're not going anywhere, everything is sent, you'll get a test mail if you want to send to a group. And the next step, you'll be able to review. And then if you submit, the email will go. And you can save this as a draft at any point. There's that save draft button on the bottom, even though it, it is saving. Basically, save draft is just exiting for you. Yeah. Doing one last save. Yeah. And this is being built on AngularJS framework. So entire system is uh, AngularJS. Any questions on this? So there's still the exclude group option? Yes. Yeah. Um, if you go back, go back to the uh, previous screen. So if you see here, like down below, this 
include group, exclude group. It's all, it's all in the same place. It's in the same place. So uh, another feature which we got added in core as a part of Google's summer of code was A-B testing. So A-B testing is nothing but it allows you to have a two uh, variations of email, send the email to your subset of your constituents, test it, whichever is the best one, you send it to the remainder of your uh, group. So by default, CV comes with three options. You can send either variation of subject from names, or you can send to different emails. And you can then, once you are sent, or you check the how each, what was the positive response from each of the email, and based on that, you just uh, take a call which one needs to be sent for the rest of the constituents. So in this case, let's look at the subject. So second step, you select your target, selected groups, then you select how much percentage of this total constituent you want to send it to the A and B. So A and B are the equal distributions. So it's only 20, 20% and the rest is 60 here. And this, uh, the way it's designed is from your set of main pool, it picks up the random constituent. So it's not sequential or something. So it's very random. So that it's very, uh, so your data, whatever you receive is very accurate. Once you select your target, uh, you compose your email based on what you are selected, in this case, subject. So now I have two subjects here, subject A, subject B. You can preview A, preview B. Once you are done, you can schedule the mailing, and then you'll get the result screen. On the result screen, there are various parameters. So based on your preference, or because each organization will have different criteria or definition of what's a successful mailing is. Some people might have how many people opened it. Some people say how many uh, were click throughs, how many forwarded them. So based on that, you can take a call. This, if you keep on refreshing, you'll get the data here. And then if let's say if mailing A was successful, you can click select as final and the email would be sent. Any questions on this? Yeah, it's a random AB group. Yes. Josh. So, I don't know, maybe I'm just curious, but so it's not going to um, pick which one is going to be getting the best response and then switch to that, like from the other ones, or you, you would have to manually change that? So, it, it doesn't pick it ma uh, automatically. It uh, Because uh, I think that there was some rationale behind it that the conscious decision was taken not to do it manually, mainly because not people to do wanted- it automatically. Uh, sorry, not to do it automatically because people wanted more control over like, they don't want like machine to directly send it. So it's only that's the reason why it was saying, admin will go verify which one is the correct, and then you'll go and click on top which is a mail, and the email will be sent accordingly. Cool. Hey, we're gonna, I think we're kind of running out of time. Um, so I'm gonna go over some of the smaller features that are in 4.6 pretty quickly. And mainly the idea here is that you may see something that you say, oh gosh, we really need that. And you'll know to look for it when you get the release going. Um, this is a uh, feature that basically um, is modeled after the ability to enter membership payments and contributions in, event, uh, in batch, but now you can also do that for pledge payments. So if, you, if your organization um, uses pledges and you receive pledge payments uh, in the mail via check, for instance, um, and you wanna be able to record a whole bunch of them at once, um, you would use a similar interface here. You say that you wanna enter pledges, um, you would uh, enter the contact name and then automatically uh, the outstanding pledge payments for that contact would be shown. Uh, you select them and enter the, the, the amount. The amount would be pre-filled based on the expected payment, um, but you would um, then be able to just record it, and now that pledge payment is recorded as completed. Um, Another new feature um, that I think is pretty cool and takes our peer-to-peer uh, -peer fundraising just another little step forward is this idea of notifications for the peer fundraisers. Um, so we've always uh, had a situation where the organization 
gets notified along with the actual donor when a contribution has come in through somebody's uh, personal campaign page. But the person who actually has the page, they can go to their page and see the, uh, the scroller, but they, they don't get notified of it. And so this feature adds that as an option. And organizations can choose a couple of different ways to configure that. Um, they can allow the person who's running the, their own personal campaign to decide if they want to receive the notifications. They can basically force them to receive the notifications, um, or they can turn this whole thing off. And the default is that the person who set up the page gets to say, yeah, I'd like to be notified whenever somebody contributes to my page so I can thank them and kind of know how I'm doing with my campaign. Um, and then uh, the person, if the notifications are turned on, they get a nice little email like that. Uh, as usual, it's a message template that can be customized a bit and changed as you'd like. Um, but basically, it's telling the person that they received a donation to a particular page, who it came from, and how much it was. Um, so I think that's a, a nice little new feature add. Um, somewhat bigger change, I think, is that we've done an overhaul of the overall reports um, user interface. Um, so this is kind of how stuff was in 4.5 and before. So if you went to report an existing report, um, you'd see uh, these two panes for criteria and settings, and then maybe the data, or maybe you didn't have any data that matched the criteria. Um, but it was always a little bit mysterious. I mean, what's, what's behind that pane? What's the difference between criteria and settings? And then once you open them up, there's just a very long, big scrolling thing of all the columns, and then another big scrolling thing of all the filters that you can put on the report. Um, so kind of messy. Um, so I don't think we're quite at Nirvana yet, but <laughs> um, we've, we've re, re, uh, organized that UI so that now, uh, when you first come to a report, um, basically the settings and criteria are broken up into tabs. Uh, so these are the columns. This is how it sorts. Um, these are the display options, the filters. And so it's a lot easier to know what you might want to get into to actually change that. And um, I can show that in actual report real quick. I think it'll be clearer. Um, so here's a contribution details report. And uh, I have some existing columns. I want to just add, uh, let's see. Um, I want to add uh, the contribution page that it came on. I can just do that. and give you the report, and the report's going to update with the contribution page, and that's it. Uh, I want to change my filters. I hit the filters. So it's, it's more compact and I think more understandable. Um, I think we've got still got a little bit of way to go dealing with some of these columns and maybe a better way to present those, but um, I think it's a pretty, pretty good step forward. Um, Scheduled reminders have had some improvements uh, that I think people who use them a lot um, might find useful. Uh, probably the biggest change is to how membership renewal reminders are handled. Previously, um, if you wanted to set those up, um, you had to set up the reminder with a repeating property, which was kind of confusing. And since the re renewal schedule might get off with the, remind with the repeat schedule, sometimes people didn't get reminded uh, in the way that they were expected. Um, so now you don't need to do that. And basically, the way stuff is set up, if you set up something to remind people when their membership, like three days or five days before their membership was going to expire, through whatever renewal cycles happen, year after year after year, they'll continue to get those reminders at the appropriate time as you set them up without you having to do anything fancy. Um, so that's pretty cool. And then we've also added um, the possibility of uh, reminding people, uh, sending people reminders on birthdays or anniversaries, so based on contact demographics, and also um, being able to trigger reminder actions based on when a contact record was created or when it was modified. So that could be used for um, a, a greeting for a new contact in your database, for example. Um, and here's just how it looks uh, in the reminder screen. Um, basically, you have a new entity. You used to not have this contact entity. And if you pick contact entity, you get a choice of birth date, created date, modified date, marriage date. And for the birth date and marriage date, um, you can pick it to happen just once or more typically on every, um, every anniversary. Questions? OK, moving right along. Is it anybody's birthday today? No? 
Oh, darn. <laughs> Happy unbirthday. <laughs> um, then some of the smaller things that uh, we've been working on to try to make things easier in the interface. Um, Autocomplete is when you're, you go into that little field to find a contact um, and, uh, or create a contact. Well, if you've got a really big database, sometimes that particular process doesn't work really well. Um, or you've got too many uh, John Adams, for instance. Um, and you, it's helpful to have some more filters on what you're looking at in that little autocomplete. Um, so we can do that now. Um, so let's say I'm creating a new activity and I'm wanting to pick the target. And uh, I know that I'm looking for somebody who's in my newsletter subscribers group. So now I've got all these filters that I can add before I even start looking for somebody. Um, and so now these are, these are contacts in my database that start with AD in their last name but also are in the newsletter group. So it's just adding some convenience on here and making it easier to use this particular widget. Um, we've also added uh, more in-place editing uh, to make things smoother. And one cool example of that is uh, in this profile screen. Um, and this is just something that you kind of need to look for in the interface. I don't know if you can see, when I'm hovering over that first name label, there's a little set of uh, dashes around that. And what that tells me is that I can double click there and actually save, change the name. I don't know what I call this. Maybe I'd say first name. Um, and just save it. And that actually saves the profile record. Um, that also can apply to things that are selectors. So um, if I want to change that, again, a lot, a lot faster and easier than actually going into the full edit form and changing something like that. So keep your eye out for places like that. Um, we've also made some, okay. yep. Does this work on the search results? No. Not yet. Uh, Not yet. So yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> that would be so cool. Helpful. Yeah. Um, let's talk to Coleman about that. <laughs> um, advanced search screen is, uh, is a bit of a bear and has been for a while. And you know, we've been playing with some different layouts. Um, I think this is a, a nice improvement where the settings that have to do with whether we're using a profile for a view, how we display results, search operator and search and trash are separated and moved down to the bottom of the screen now, um, rather than being sort of all over the place near the top. And also what often happened is they got squished off the side of the screen if your browser wasn't really wide and stuff. So I think uh, this is a, a nicer way of looking at that part of the form. Um, a couple of other quickies, because I think we're getting toward the end. Um, and uh, this was a big thank you to, I don't know if they're here, Jane and Andrew from AGA Strategies. Um, I've been dealing with, for a long time, with user confusion about permissions um, and what they actually mean. Um, and so their thought was, let's, let's actually describe them when we're setting the permissions. So now, when you go into set permissions, uh, most of the permissions have some pretty detailed descriptions right underneath them in place uh, to tell you what they do. Um, another small one uh, for people who get a lot of online contributions and use different payment processes, use more than one. Um, the fact that something was paid by credit card doesn't necessarily help you when you're looking at it. You want to know whether it was Authnet or PayPal or IATS. And so that'll now show when you're looking at the record. Um, one that's kind of been an annoyance for a long time, if you're using uh, price sets, um, let's say to add, for allow people to add an additional contribution when they buy a membership, um, and you wanted to just have them put in an uh, open amount, you had to, basically they had to put in whole dollar amounts. And if they didn't, they got an error, and that wasn't really very friendly. Um, so now these additional contribution fields support decimals. Um, making it a little bit nicer for the contributor. And um, for people who have dead folks in their database, which may, may be, I don't know how many of you do, but probably quite a few, um, it's really uh, helpful to know really loud and upfront that this person is not around anymore and you don't start sending them mail or emails or stuff like that. So that's just, uh, just showing that. Um, 
So I think we're kind of at the end here, and I just want to note again that a lot of the improvements that you're seeing here and a lot of the things that are in the 4.6 release are here um, because people helped to make them happen. And so this is a, um, a list of the folks who have specifically supported through funding or actually um, engineering help, supported the core team in putting this release together. And it's really the power of community that uh, helps make City Serum better and better. So uh, I'd propose a round of applause to the folks who helped. Thank you.